think Islam's misrepresented there when people say it lends itself to violence more than other religions? Very, very much so, because and there are explicit statements of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And he says many times, and in one occasion he says, I have not come but to perfect your character. You know, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said that there will come a time where there will be people from amongst the community. When you look at them, you will think that your Islam is nothing. They will look outwardly very practicing. And when you see them in prayer, you will think that they are engulfed in prayer to a level that you cannot even reach. In other words, they be, you'll think they're amazing Muslims, but Islam will not even go below their throats. Carte Blanche that applies to everybody, which is what some ex-Muslims tell me that it is, then you're going to have a problem with it. You see my point? And so it's about, you know, knowledge is power. But for some people, ignorance is bliss. Now, if I'm a young lad, I want to smoke spliff, I want to go clubbing, I want to have the odd girlfriend here and there, casual relationships, right? I don't really fancy waking up in the morning and praying. I don't like fasting because I find it hard, right? It's very easy for me to look at these type of incidents, right? Take them out of context and then deny the religion. And that is honestly my fundamental experience that I've found with most people. That's the foundational thing. They found it hard. They had some doubts. They didn't deal with the doubts rationally, logically, or investigate them thoroughly. Ill-informed, it sounds like. Maybe ill-informed, right? And they apostatize. But you know, that's their choice. That's their decision. It is, in the Quran, Allah clearly says there's no compulsion in religion. It also says they can either believe or they can disbelieve. What does it say about apostasy? Well, apostasy comes under, under the Sharia, right? And apostasy is not just somebody who decides to leave their religion and decides not to practice. In Saudi Arabia, there are many people who don't believe in Islam. They were born Muslims. They don't pray. They don't fast. They don't do anything other than the holy celebrations, the party, get-togethers. Nobody's executing them. Nobody's running after them to, you know, execute them. But if you make your apostasy public, and it is deemed that you're now standing against the, uh, the government at the time, and you are a threat, then within Islam that is seen as treason. Now you're, now you're a problem. So if you want to apostatize, that's fine. You want to leave the religion, you don't want to practice the religion, you want to do what you want to do, that's fine. That is a matter between you and God. As soon as you bring it into the public arena and you now want to uh, dis, uh, uh, disunite and cause problems within society, now it becomes a societal problem. Because let me give you an example. Supposing you apostatize, now you say, I can drink alcohol. Why can't I drink it in public? I'm not Muslim anymore. But your freedom now is affecting the freedoms of others around you. I'll tell you why. You may choose to drink and drive. You may kill my son now. Now your freedoms will affect my, my, my life. You may encourage others to do things which are outside the Sharia. They may be lewd, they may be crude, they may be whatever. That will not be conforming towards the, a modest or a decent Sharia within a country. So what you do in private is your business. You bring it into the public arena, it has consequences. But that does not mean to say that you leave Islam, you're executed. The way that people have played this apostasy card is like once you're in the faith, that's it. You can't leave, otherwise you're dead. I've spoken to about a dozen 
Obviously, apostates the here on yeah, camera. He was the he it's on YouTube. Yeah, They've got tens of thousands of votes. Which Muslim brother is going up to them to kill them? Or hunting them down? Many of them know what area they live in, where they live. <laughs> Who, who's going to crash their car into them and, and kill them? Nobody. Well, I went to a, the, uh, the Council of Ex-Muslims. They had a function two, two years ago, a Christmas, a Christmas party. And they had to release the venue uh, on like a secret underground email network the day before. Right. Because of the threat of violence from yes. not, not just Muslims, but family members who, knew, who, know, who know that they've apostatized. Look, there are nut cases out there. But, what but they I did was sensible. Was a bit I would have advised them to do the same thing. Because I know that there are nutcases out there. You understand my point? My point, look. It seems to me like there are more nutcases in the Islamic religion than any other. Well, you see, look. Look, the, the, the issue is the problem here. The problem is perception is everything these days. If I'm told enough times about something, I feel that it must be true. Yes? If you say, okay, there are more nut cases in Islam, then let's just do the, let's add up the figures then. Let's see the data. In the last hundred years, how many people have Muslims killed? And how many people have uh, non-Muslims killed? Even if you, even if you establish the, uh, uh, the, the figures pro rata, you know, per population size, and you do the projection. Yeah, yeah. What are the figures? Well, in my lifetime, it seems to be. I, I, I don't know the figures, obviously. Right, well, I'll tell you. Look, even in my lifetime and your lifetime, how many people died in Iraq? A few hundred thousand. Well, as the minimum estimate, the estimate goes to over a million. How many people died in Afghanistan? How many people dying every year in Waziristan and in Pakistan from drone attacks? 1,400 in one year, 1,400 in one year. And, are, they, and these are non-Muslims killing Muslims, is that what you're saying? I'm saying these are non-Muslims killing predominantly Muslims. Yeah, yeah. But it's not done in the name of a, it's, 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 it's very much political, it's not done in the name of a religious ideology. You're wrong. You know Bush, when he went to Camp David, Blair went over there as well. Blair himself is an evangelical Christian, right? They went into the chapel. Blair, till today, denies that he prayed before the Gulf War. He denies it. So I'm not going to lie and say that Blair said he did. No, he, he says he didn't. So, so no, hold on a second. But his aides, Bush, Bush's aides, in a book written by a journalist entitled The Faith of George W. Bush, he writes in there that the aides that were present said they have no doubt that they prayed before the Iraq war. Bush himself said several times that this is a crusade against ignorance, against darkness. Right? Islam. The, Christians, the, the Christian soldiers in Iraq were writing messages of the Bible on the bombs that they threw on the Iraqis. Wow. They were drawing crosses on the bombs that they threw down in Iraq. I'm not saying that it was completely religiously orchestrated. I'm not saying that. But to argue that the religion was not involved in their actions, you can go on Google and see the pictures of those soldiers who've taken pictures of bombs with Christian uh, text, Bible texts and crosses on those bombs. So do you feel it's Christians killing Muslims? I no. I don't feel when the Muslims are killing non-Muslims that it's Muslims doing that or Islam doing that. And I don't believe and I don't believe that when the Christians are doing it that they're following their religion either. I think these are deviant people who have lost the very core message of their prophets and their religion. That's what I believe. Well, even, what I believe. even the Buddhists in Burma targeting and killing and raping Muslims, I don't believe they're doing it because they're good Buddhists. Of course. Well, Buddhism is, is pacifist. But they're monks. They are monks doing it. But it I don't believe, even the Dalai Lama said that these are not part of our faith. 
but they classify themselves as observant Buddhists. Oh, the, 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 the distinction I'm, I would like to make there is that Christianity does not advocate killing non-believers. Buddhism does not advocate killing non-Buddhists. Non That's not true. When you look at the story of Balaam, Balaam, and people were executed for associating not partners with God and not observing the law. They were put to death. And in fact, those same verses were used by the Spanish Inquisition in Southern America. And they quoted these savage people deserve death for the same reason that Balaam, for not following the law, for, uh, for associating partners with God. Look, my brother, today's perception is that Islam is somehow uniquely responsible for turning good people into nutcases. The reality is that if you look at the data, the evidence, now I'll quote you somebody who's very, very interesting, very articulate and very knowledgeable on the subject, and he's not a Muslim. His name is, um, um, God, I've just built up to that and I've forgotten his name. His name is um, um, Scott Atram. Scott Atram has conducted an extensive study on terrorism and suicide bombing. He's not only gone and met the survivors who survived uh, the attacks themselves, but those survivors who conducted the attacks, the, the ones that survived, their families, their communities, their madrasa, and he advises governments on how to combat extremism. Listen to what he has to say on the subject. It's better for us as rational, reasonable human beings to understand that there is a narrative in the media, in social media, that may be very strong and very convincing, but it may not necessarily uh, be woven into successfully the data that is actually out there. And people like Scott Atram, I respect the individual because he looks at the data, not the rhetoric. He cuts through all the dead wood, the chaff, and he goes to the very core of the data. And what he has found, his investigation, is that even though some of these groups, they cite religion for why they want to go and kill the infidel, what leads them up to that are factors that are geopolitical are not religious. The icing on the cake to wash away the, the conscience of, of what, what they're about to do, they fabricate, manipulate, misquote religion as the icing of the cake to justify what they're doing. And the reason why he cites that is he says, you find no scholarship amongst their groups. No Islamic hard scholarship, recognized scholarship. These are often self-taught, do-it-yourself DIY jobs, like myself. I'm not a scholar. I haven't been to scholarship. But some people say, oh, I find you very persuasive. Just because the words seem sweet, it doesn't mean that there is real substance of knowledge behind them. And they convince people to go to Syria. I would disagree because I've met people who are. <laughs> and I've been like, whoa, I, I, I don't know anything. These guys are knowledgeable. I don't know anything. And perhaps one of the aspects of your journey of knowledge is really very soon recognizing just how little you know when real scholarship you know, comes and, and interacts with you. You, you realise that you're in a different league. I think Islam's misrepresented there when people say it lends itself to violence more than other religions. Very, very much so, because and there are explicit statements of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And he says many times, and in one occasion he says, I have not come but to perfect your character. Your character is not just how you interact with fellow Muslims. 
there are explicit statements of the Prophet Muhammad that a dimmi, uh, a, a, a man, a woman, living in a Muslim land, non-Muslim, he's in a treaty a under the protection of the Muslims. If he is treated unjustly, I will be his advocate on the day of judgment. That means if you're not a Muslim and I'm living in a Muslim land and you're living with me and you're in a, in a peace treaty with me and I treat you unjustly, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, who I follow, believe in, will stand with you on the day of judgment and argue your case against me. This, ex this is explicit. So this argument that people apply... I just, to, I just to clarify, obviously, yes. I don't believe that bit's true. Which bit? The Day of Judgment. Uh, of course, no. But I do as a Muslim, right? So the Prophet's warning me as a Muslim that if you treat a non-Muslim badly in your land, then be careful. Because you, on the Day of Judgment, me as a Muslim, you're going to be accountable. Obviously, the non-Muslim doesn't believe this, right? He doesn't believe this, right? But as a Muslim, I'm being warned. Make sure you're just and fair and honest. When a Jew and a Muslim comes to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, because they have a disagreement, a financial disagreement. The Prophet hears both people. Is it compulsory that you say, peace be upon him, after everything yes. you mentioned today? Yes. Say it in Arabic. Uh, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We have to say, peace be upon him, to Jesus as well, to Moses, to all of the Prophets. It's a mark of respect and honor that we give them. So these two people come to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and ask him about who is correct. The Prophet of Allah, peace be upon him, sides with the Jew. He says, he's correct, you're wrong. Give him what is due. So Islam's quite merciful in that sense. Because we believe in the Quran, Allah says, and this, this verse is mentioned, uh, written uh, in Harvard. They pick the three verse uh, statements in history that were the most profound legal statements ever they selected one of them from the quran allah says oh ye who believe stand up as witnesses in justice even against yourselves against your parents against your kin whether one is rich or poor in other words in the sight of allah if you're not just to a muslim or a non-muslim you're accountable you're in deep trouble, deep trouble. It's not a small thing, it's a big thing. Now these people, they say, oh no, they're infidels. We can slay them, we can kill them wherever we find them. Look, it says it here in the Quran. Hold on a second, brother. It's talking about people who broke a treaty. It's referring to the treaty of Mecca when the, uh, between the Meccans, the Quraysh, the non-Muslims and the Muslims. And it's talking about a subject matter where the treaty was repeatedly broken for seven years and the Muslims were told not to fight them, not to wage war with them. And then after seven years, the order came, fight them and kill them wherever you find them. But what are the verses afterwards? But if they want peace, give them peace and escort them to a land of safety. Now, if I'm a nut job and I want to go and kill non-Muslims, I'll quote the little bit in the middle and I'll justify my actions. And then the media get hold of it and it goes on WhatsApp and it goes on Telegram and it goes on all of these little things. Look, it says it in the Quran. And then the people think, my God, yes, look, that's why they're doing it. They're doing it because they're corrupting and misquoting and manipulating things within Islam to feed their own predispositions. They already hate non-Muslims. Bruv, they don't even hate non-Muslims, they hate Muslims. I get enough stick. People telling me I'm not a real Muslim because I said this or I did that. From I'm, who? From fellow Muslims sometimes. You understand my point? So there's been a lot of internal conflict within this. Not really, there's a minority of people, but unfortunately they get the majority of the stage. They're a very hand, they're a handful of, not, look, if Muslims truly were nut jobs and it turned rational, reasonable people into nut jobs, we've had some horrible terrorist attacks here, I agree. But there's over two or three million of us here. There should be somebody, God forbid, may it never happen. There should be somebody dying every day. 
there should be dozens of people dying every day if my religion truly encouraged me to do that. It clearly doesn't. And that's why we don't see it but in the sort of frequency that we should. In humanity, you still have a moral code regardless of what your... No, but... Look... Your, your, your ancient religious type of teaching. Well, well, that morality that you talk about... But I, I agree... The, sorry. Yeah. To just hark back to what you said about the um, for geopolitical reasons, the social reasons, that lead someone to then actually using their religion as a... A tool. A tool, a tool, yeah. Uh, as a guise to then go out and kill Muslims. Hello, Akbar. Yeah. Kill yeah. Yeah. Kafar. Yeah. Um, but Islam is inherently, when you're talking now, I think thinking correctly, Islam is very well designed. It's inherently politicized. It's inherently political. It's a political religion. Islam, political well, Islam is a complete way of life. And so politics is also a part of that way of life. Mm. Now, why that's a good thing, it's because unless we have politics that's done, uh, conducted with honesty and integrity and with compassion, for your people, for foreign people, unless you adhere to some basic foundational moral principles, it's not going to be a good political system. And so Islam says that when you choose a leader, choose somebody who is just, fair, decent, religious, academically qualified, you know, rationally able to, con to, to uh, be able to conduct himself, or, you know, in a way, that will be conducive to that important role. So Islam is an all-encompassing religion like that. It's not about, well, see what the Christians say, with all due respect, and I'm not trying to bash the Christians here, but they say, give unto Caesar what is Caesar's. In other words, they say, the laws of the land can be independent of the religion. But I don't know how you can do that. Because there are many things that may become legal, that your religion would actually argue as immoral. So how can you reconcile the two by saying that that's correct? I can, I can say as a Muslim that I have to respect the law of the land. In this country, it's illegal to gamble. I have to respect the rights of every individual who wants to go and gamble. But I'm not allowed to open up a casino myself, even though it's, I'm legally allowed to do so. Because my religion says no. I can't stop you as a non-Muslim, if you're a non-Muslim, to go and gamble. It's not my right to do that, right? Because the law of the land says it's your freedom to do that. If a lady is walking down here with a, a mini skirt on, I can't go up to her and say, that's disgusting, cover yourself up. I'm living in a country that has a certain system, a certain law. My choice as a Muslim is I can look better, away. Better I look away, I look away. Or if I can't and I find it too tempting or too difficult to gamble, to drink, to womanize, then I should leave the country to another country where I can practice my religion. But it's not permissible for me to force my religion onto other people. You see my point? But there are some, a minority of Muslims who do do that. But that's not Islam. That's not what we're supposed to do. But they will, you know, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said, there will come a time where there will be people from amongst the community when you look at them you will think that your Islam is nothing they will look outwardly very practicing and when you see them in prayer you will think that they are engulfed in prayer to a level that you cannot even reach in other words they'll be you'll think they're amazing Muslims but Islam will not even go below their throats. And they will be a treacherous people. They will commit crimes, huge crimes in society. So we've been warned about these people. Islam is not about me wearing a long foe, wearing a cap, having a, you know, uh, the beads in my hand, you know? And now I'm a good and a big beard down to my waist, right? And that makes me a good Muslim. It's about what you have inside your heart, how your manners, your integrity, your honesty, and of course your worship. Now the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said on a Friday prayer, wear the best clothes of your community. I was born in England. My community is a long shirt. 
Right, long shirt, smart. Okay, I'm not allowed to wear very tight trousers because it shouldn't be revealing. So slightly baggy trousers, right? For me, that's Islamic dress. I can go to the mosque on a Friday dressed as an Englishman. You know, if I want to wear a nice suit, I can wear a nice suit. I don't have to wear an Arab outfit or a Pakistani outfit or a Bangladeshi outfit. I don't have to do that. In fact, it's recommended. Wear the best clothes of your community. My community is English. You see my point? Islam is not about tearing people apart. It's about joining on commonality where we have common interests, common you know, uh, culture, tradition. But where we differ on religious uh, aspects, for you, your religion, for me, my religion. But there are some people who don't, don't behave in that way. That is not Islam. That is people who have a, a, a predisposition to do certain things and then their anger needs a fulfillment. And so they find any way they can to squeeze the square peg through the round hole. Look, Christianity had it in history. You look at the Crusades, what was that? Spanish Inquisition. You know, they used Christianity, but you could never argue, I believe, that Jesus truly preached those things. He didn't. No, no, no. I, I think I think Muhammad did was he's one son. He was a war monger. He did all the killing of people. He well, was, see it that was, it was a time of war. Well, you see, look. It is, it is where Jesus Christ died for human sin, the ultimate passage. Right. But you see, if you say that as a Christian, and I was just saying that earlier to a brother, that they say Jesus never killed anybody, never ordered the death of anybody. Okay. But most Christians believe in the Trinity. They believe Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Ghost is God. They are all one being. Right? They're at one. They don't differ. I don't, I don't entirely understand. Anyway, but they don't differ in their decisions or their judgment. They're at one. So when Moses is ordered to kill 3,000 people when they worship the calf, that means Jesus must have also agreed to that. If you believe in the Trinity. You can't say that he didn't then. So you can't have it both ways. Now, did Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, order the deaths of certain people? Actually, very few, very few. But well, he did. Yes, of course, because under God's commandment, if you so, for example, there was a man who pretended to convert to Islam. He then left with two companions to uh, uh, visit his town to teach his people. There was another occasion where a small group of people said that they accepted Islam. Then they said, give us your best scholars who can teach us the Quran. I think the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, sent them 40 of the best scholars, the best Qurans, the best reciters. They ambushed them outside and they slayed them all, they killed them. The Prophet said, for these people, the penalty is that they must die. Because this is treason, treachery, and they've killed, they've murdered. That's the order of God. The Jews have it, the Christians have it, the Muslims have it. What you're not permitted to do in Islam is a people who don't wish to fight you, it is not permissible for you to fight them. A people who lower their arms on the battlefield and surrender, you may not kill them. A people who have a treaty with you, you may not fight them. And even if they attack you, on the battlefield, on the battlefield, you cannot chop down trees, you cannot kill children, you may not uh, kill women, you may not kill animals, livestock, you may not destroy the land, you may not do this, you may not do that, you may not... The way you're talking is very archaic. I mean, you, the when, you, when you speak, I mean, it's the 21st century, yes. and a lot of this is common sense. And you still talk about it like it's, it's present day. Well, it's not common sense. I'll tell you why. Because even today, humanity do not operate under these rules. And I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to slag off uh, the West. 
I see myself more Westerner than Indian, even though my parents are Indian. I was born here, brought up here. It's a language that I'm most fluent in, the language I dream in, and occasionally say the odd harsh word in, right? Okay? So, I'm not trying to, you know, get the boot in. When we do Hiroshima, when we go and do Nagasaki, when we go and bomb these countries, we don't care about the trees or the animals or the women or the children or the la We don't care. In Iraq, we launched uranium tipped missiles that were taken, I think, from waste, radioactive waste, to make the missiles burn at such a ferocious temperature that they would burn through tanks and burn through. Th we scattered that uranium all over those poor people who are still suffering today. So my friend, we don't operate within those Islamic ideals, even in the West today. Where well, Islam says, still choose to live here. Still of course, I love this country. I love this country. I would live nowhere else. This is home to me because I believe that today there is more Islam in England than I can find in many of my uh, Muslim countries. I don't think you're wrong there. It's, 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 it seems to be building up quite a bit of momentum. You know? yeah. I believe that a lot of the justice that we operate here is more Islamic justice than I can find in many Muslim countries. So I'm look. I'm not going to say something about Islam. No, it says I says something about those people, about those leaders. Most most Muslims in those countries are just honest and decent people. I've broke bread with many Muslims in many countries: Morocco, Saudi Arabia, Oman, uh, you know, Kenya. Uh, it's a mixed country, obviously, not just all Muslims. Senegal, you know. Um, I've, I've broke bread with many Muslims. They're good, decent people. Sometimes, you know, people who govern them are not good, decent people. They kill their own people. When they stand up for peace, when they stand up for justice, they're quashed. Sometimes we help those people quash them because it suits our agenda. So sometimes the very innocent people who are trying to stand up for their rights, we in the West will help the, the tyrants to quash their own people. So, you know, we, we don't operate with those ideals. Are there certain Muslim lands where there are major problems? Of course there are. Are there Muslims out there who are nasty, horrible people? Of course there are. Yeah. However, however, as a rational, reasonable, measured human being, as an honest human being who wants to really discover the truth, let's not make that jump out of convenience because it conforms to what we already believe. Let's look at the data. Let's talk to the average Muslim woman. You know, you're wearing a hijab. Are you oppressed by your husband? Is he really forcing you to wear that? The answer that you will find 99 times out of 100, if not 99.99 times out of 100 is, I choose to wear it. I can't force my wife to wear the hijab. She can tell me to get lost, right? I can't force her. I can't, of course I can't. But she wears it out of choice. It's her choice. If she took it off, I would advise her. But I can't force her. It might be the, the illusion of choice, though. Well, if it's almost true. I mean. Well, look, we do things. Look, can I choose not to pray? I will do my utmost, even if it means praying on a rainy floor in a rainy floor even if I'm freezing I'll, I will try to make my prayer okay now can I choose not to do it of course I can why don't I why will I not why will I not make that choice though because if I believe something to be true and if I believe that God told me that this is after the belief in me the most important thing for you to observe is your five prayers. I will try my utmost to make sure that I pray those things. Now you could argue that you've been brainwashed, you've been, uh, you know, you've been threatened or whatever. I would disagree. I would say that I made a rational choice in my teens to investigate this religion of my parents and ensure that if I follow it, 
I have to be 100% convinced of it. Otherwise, I'm going to be out there with my mates drinking, smoking the odd spliff, having a few girlfriends, because there were some very attractive girls around in my time, right? There still are. Just the same temptations that every young man, every young woman goes through, right? So I well, made not necessarily bad things. I mean, I'm well, really sort of frame those things as being very bad, like very uh, amoral and just sort of decadent. And, you know, well, if you look at society, you look at society today, look at alcohol, right? Alcohol. It's a socially accepted drug, but even non-Muslim academics are saying that if it was invented today, it probably would be banned. Now, why are they saying that? They're saying that because of hindsight, right? They're saying that because now we have the data to actually realize the gravity, the gravity of what alcohol does to society. But Allah said in the Quran, in both gambling and alcohol, there is benefit and there is harm. But because the harm outstrips, the sin outstrips the benefit, we've made it haram for you. We've made it forbidden for you. Now, just imagine such a beautiful society, as successful as we are in England. We are a very successful society. We have to accept that. Science, technology, mathematics. I'm not saying we invented these things, but I'm saying that we are incredibly advanced. You know, we invented- of the Enlightenment, products of the Enlightenment. Enlightenment, and of course, we were very clever. When uh, the Islamic empire and the science in Andalus, in Spain, diminished, we were clever. We took the baton of knowledge, just like the Arabs took the baton of knowledge and, and built on it from the Greeks. We took much of it from the Arabs. But we, our, our growth was explosive after that. I'm not saying we owe everything to the Arabs, because clearly we've discovered many things. But our foundation, certainly we do owe to what came out of uh, Andalus and Greek uh, you know, philosophy, etc., etc. But we invented the jet engine in the Second World War. There are countries out there that can, can still not make a, a jet engine because it requires a level of sophistication, right? Of metal and all sorts of different things, right? We're a very advanced nation. But just imagine how advanced we would have become if we didn't drink and we didn't gamble. Just imagine how advanced our social dynamics between father, son, mother, and child would have improved so, so, so what if you're, we didn't... What you're inferring there is that you think England or Britain should embrace Islam. I'm saying that it would improve dramatically because we already have so many foundational structures and beliefs that to build on that with the Islamic morality and ideology would, would dramatically explode, this country would explode in, 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 in beauty, I believe. I think the reason that we are, we are so advanced and progressive is because it's not an Islamic part of the world. I, I disagree with you. Islam is a propensity to be very backwards and repressive. Look, look, I disagree. I tell you why I disagree with you. When Islam came to the Arabs, they were savage. So savage, actually, that the Romans didn't even want to uh, go and uh, conquer them. They said, it's just sand and dates. And these guys are all savage. Yeah, but that's what it was. Look, that's all they had. Sand and dates. They had sand, they had dates, they had nothing. 